I really want to welcome you good people here. Uh, uh, it's fantastic to see you all. Um, uh, what we're going to do today, we've got uh, uh, six of us here. We're each going to speak for about uh, six minutes or so, uh, so a little more than a half hour of us speaking. We will then open it up for your discussion. We want to hear what you think about uh, the, the Donald Sterling, uh, uh, yeah, it, the, 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 just this very interesting moment. Uh, a lot of us, you know, we like it when things like this happen because it brings everything to the surface. <laughs> they all come out of the woodwork, you know, and now we can really deal with what's real. Um, and, uh, and Donald Sterling uh, sure did that. You know what, Kashfi, I've got, this is one of my favorite players. All right, can you go ahead and put up the quotes that I had uh, on the... Uh, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll jump back and forth between the quotes. And the, this is, of course, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who happens to be my favorite basketball player of all time, uh, one of the more politically astute uh, of the ball players, uh, the professional athletes. Uh, he, of course, came up in a time where he was sort of alone in his uh, political uh, analysis and activism, uh, unlike what's happening now. At least that's what I'm going to be arguing, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, nice image of Kareem there. Uh, you should read his piece in Time Magazine, uh, if you haven't already, on the right the day after Sterling said what he said, uh, that piece went up, uh, just arguing for, you, you really can put it in the context, the larger context. Uh, it's not just an isolated incident, this is part of a larger context. Um, but uh, we've just pulled out some of the, the quotes here from, the, uh, from the, the famous, I thought it was a phone call at first, but I'm reminded <laughs> it was actually a, a conversation. Yeah, so she, I don't know how she, ta I guess she just had a telephone or something she and just, yeah, wired. had a tape going. <laughs> <Did> <laughs> <you say so? laughs> Very, uh, yeah, fascinating. And now they're, now of course, they're calling in the question, you know, that they're, for her taping it, she's being, this, 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 mm -hmm. anyway, that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, but these are some of the choice quotes that I pulled out. Uh, Kashfi, thanks for that suggestion. Uh, uh, and we can just have them up there while we're talking because we're responding to this stuff uh, on this panel. Um, last year we got together uh, uh, a year, approximately a year ago from, from, from now, from this week, um, and we did a, a panel, I should have printed out another flyer, uh, we called it $40 Million Slaves, White Supremacy in American Sport. This is in some ways a bit of a reprise of that panel and uh, maybe once a year we'll get together and uh, see where we're at with respect to how, how racism, sexism is working in, uh, in the world of, of American sport. Um, uh, Satish Ram and Michelle Gregory uh, were both on that panel um, and uh, the other panelists Marcy Blackman, Cecil Harris and was that it? We just have five? Cecil. Was it Matthew Bullard? Ah, he, no, that's right, Cecil was his mm -hmm. substitute, yeah. Uh, they, they both wrote and wished us that their very best. They could not make it today. We invited them to be here uh, as well as uh, Matthew Corcoran, Professor Corcoran we asked to be here. Uh, he couldn't make it and Ron Daniels as well was going to join us, uh, but he had to be in Washington doing what he does, uh, giving President Obama all kinds of hell. So, uh, so, uh, so uh, with all of those good wishes, I, I am happy to announce those publicly. And uh, last year I spent about 20 minutes introducing everybody just because it was so much fun uh, talking about uh, uh, all of the accomplishments and the backgrounds of the people. I'm going to just be very brief today. Um, uh, this is Dr. George White. He's a, a professor of uh, history here and a, uh, the chair of the history department. He's, uh, he, he's written on um, uh, uh, a, a good book on, on foreign po American foreign policy in Africa. Um, working on a second book now that'll be out on uh, on blacks in the military, particularly a military chaplain, uh, Dokes is yeah. his name, yeah, yeah Reverend exactly. Dokes. Um, uh, and just, I had the privilege of barging in on his lecture the other day, this is a brilliant analysis <laughs> of why black Americans serve in the military and what mm -hmm. goes on when they do. I mean, it was really great. I hope you don't mind. Thank you. No, yeah, no, no, no. I, I just love doing that to you. If I'm, if I'm around on Thursday, 6 o'clock, I'm busting in on this lecture. <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, and I have learned that in my conversations with Brother White that his analysis of sport is uh, magnificent. Uh, and uh, I suspect uh, both he and I are working our analyses of American sport into our work uh, as we are pushing forward in these, these months. So anyway, Brother George White, Satish Ram, uh, who uh, he, he writes, uh, he's a sociology major here. Are you by any chance an English minor? We were wondering, did you, have you taken enough English classes? I have considered it. Yeah, okay, all right. <laughs> we weren't sure. Uh, we were talking about you earlier. Um, very proud to say this was just uh, accepted into the CUNY Pipeline Program for the PhD. <laughs> really one of the, one of the two uh, most prestigious fellowships that a CUNY undergraduate can, can, uh, can be awarded, so we're, we're very pleased about that. Um, the other uh, uh, awardee, uh, accepted uh, fellow, is also in the audience with us, and I'm, I'm, she's, she's, I'm embarrassing her, I know, but that's Alexa Chambers. 
two of them will be beginning in the summer program this summer. Uh, and if any of you are interested, by the way, in that program, uh, you can just talk to me at, at your convenience. Uh, Satish also writes at metsmerizedonline.com, uh, uh, a Mets, uh, technically a blog, I guess, uh, um, and, uh, and is just a, a great fan of, of baseball and the rest of the American sporting world, so we're happy to have him here. Uh, Brother Noel Torres, so glad you could join us. I've been trying to get him on one of these for about two years now, and uh, yeah, it's great to see you here. Uh, I imagine you are uh, basking not in the, he's an Oklahoma Thunder fan, uh, uh, and, uh, not in the victory last night, but in Kevin Durant's speech, oh, yes, yes, yeah, which I, I hope all of you had a chance. Yeah, I, I mean, just a, a marvelous example of graciousness. Uh, and when he started talking about his mother, you know, and he said, Mom, you're the MVP, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I just, I just said, that's it for me. I can't talk to nobody for about three hours. And I'm crying my eyes out, you know, really. Yeah, so I hope you enjoyed the, uh, yeah, and uh, I always go to Noel. He's an English major here, and I always go to him for uh, when the playoff time comes around. I don't follow the game as nearly as closely as he does, but when, the, when it gets hot, you know, I get interested. And uh, I always say, okay, Noel, what's the analysis? <laughs> who, 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 who am I supporting here? Where we got the black coaches? You know. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, so Noel is, is just been. It's always wonderful to, to discuss the world of sport with Noel. Um, Dr. Michelle Gregory, uh, so happy to have you back. Uh, it's always a pleasure to see you, um, uh, uh, Sister Gregory. Uh, uh, was uh, I'm going to embarrass her just a little bit. In addition to all the wonderful work that she does, she writes on um, uh, a. Uh, a sp you tell me if you correct this if you don't like the way I say it. Um, I, I came up with this myself. S uh, uh, a critique of sporting culture and vocabulary. The vocabulary around sporting culture um, uh, and the role that those things play in constructions of male supremacist paradigms in, in corporate boardrooms to um, uh, advertising agencies, uh, anywhere that people work. Uh, the way that sport, the culture of sport, the language of sport affects our workplaces. Um, uh, particularly with respect to, to paradigms of domination. It's very nice work that, that Sister Gregory does on, on that stuff. So uh, I encourage you to check out her, her work. Uh, 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 she's also uh, was a, a four-year scholarship uh, basketball player in college at LSU and also right. at uh, Northeast Louisiana, the, uh, the uh, Cajun? 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 Raging Cajuns? That's Southeast Louisiana. That's Southeast Southeast Northeast Louisiana. Louisiana is the, you told me last With year. The, um, they were actually the Tomahawks, then we changed, but the name was changed because a number of Native American tribes complained about that name, and my school did agree to change the name. Yeah, yeah, okay. So she comes, was that when you were there or later? No, much later. Yeah, okay. yeah. Would have thought you, she, when she's in a place like that, things look like that happen. <laughs> <laughs> got that kind of Change. Thing, you know, she's, <laughs> yeah, she's not just in there to fit in, you know, she's, she's in there to make it better. Uh, and that is all. That has been our experience with Sister Gregory. I can't help this. Sorry, I'm sorry. But she actually, they played in the NCAA tournament. Uh, uh, they actually played against Cheryl Miller's USC team. Uh, yeah, that was a team with the McGee sisters, and Rhonda Wintham was a point guard, I think, and uh, and Cheryl Miller. And that was a, that was the team that changed the really the world of, of women's college sports. I mean, that they that was if you look at what with the Title IX and all of that, you know, I mean, that team did so much to put women's sport, college, NCAA women's sporting culture on the map. And now, you know, look, they, I mean, they're, the NCAA tournament on the women's side was, very, I mean, they're getting the big TV contracts, the, the arenas are full. Uh, so anyway, that's much, very much part of uh, Dr. Gregory's history. So welcome again. Thank you to have you here. Um, uh, thank, you, thank you again for being here. And, uh, and Brother Josh Carrington, uh, been one of my students for several years now, uh, and it's been a pleasure to, to work with him. Uh, he's a, a, an English major. Uh, here, and uh, and uh, I was uh, every time uh, I, I, I like Brother Torres. I was hoping to get uh, Brother Carrington on one of these panels anytime soon because uh, as anytime you got anything you want to discuss from architecture to literary criticism to American sport, this guy's got something to say. <laughs> so, so we are indeed very very pleased to uh, to have him uh, on the panel, Josh Carrington. Uh, I'm Michael Nampy, um, and uh, I'm the director here at the Resource Center. I'm a professor of English, and uh, and am doing all I can to uh, to advance our understanding of the ways that white supremacy operates with respect to uh, athletics. So uh, so welcome everybody. Um, I think if you don't mind, uh, we're going to go. Dr. Gregory will get us started, and then the three of you, then Brother White, and then I'm doing it to myself. Never follow Brother White when you're doing, but I'm going to do it to myself again. I'm, I'm going and I'll, and I'll bring up the rear. We'll speak for about six minutes each, and then we will uh, throw it open to the. Uh, to the
it is. Very good. Well, again, Michael, thank you and everyone here very much, and thank all of you for coming. Actually, um, you know, it's funny to me when I see the particular quote about um, not to bring it. <laughs> I guess it means funny black people, As obviously us. funny looking <laughs> black people, yeah. to my games, mm -hmm. and um, a lot of the work I look at is those who are in positions of real power in this country. Um, and those would include many people who own NBA basketball teams. Um, when you think about, many of you have seen in the media, what it takes now, how wealthy you have to be now to own something that people play a game. Okay. And so obviously we know that you know, it, it, it's much bigger than a game. But on one hand, I don't get overly upset. And part of it is because as an academic, um, and I tell my students this as a sociologist, when, for instance, Michael and others talk about supremacy of all kinds, okay, you know it didn't happen overnight, right? Okay. And so, if largely those of us living in this country, this globe, know that we've been living in a racial hierarchy for about 450 years, what do you expect? <laughs> I mean, on the one hand, the last 53 years have been truly remarkable, okay. but you cannot disassociate those other four for hundreds of years. Okay. And when I think about, in many ways, I'm not surprised, I'm not minimizing what's happened, but I'm also in some ways proud of this sort of reaction that mm. you wouldn't have seen a couple of decades mm -hmm. ago. Okay. You wouldn't have seen the majority black NBA players. You would have seen some who would have risked, you know, but you wouldn't have seen the kind of turnout that you see. Now, when I say that is, I speak in part from experience, as Michael pointed out. I was lucky enough to play for Division I basketball teams mm -hmm. in this country. And the one famous team I played for, LSU, made famous by Shaquille O'Neal, not made famous by me, of course. <laughs> um, by Dr. Gregory. <laughs> I, I, I remember the, the, the very prominent men's coach, Dale Brown, who I was friendly with. When I was there, he told me there was a time where he could not have black players on his team. Yeah, no, he could not have them. He was told by the Board of Trustees of that school you can't bring it, <laughs> you, can't, you can't bring it here, okay? And it made me question, what does merit mean to you? So we talk about we live in a country where we promote you based on your skills and qualifications. So, and many people say, well, sports is the great place because only the greatest make it. And I thought, not always, actually, not always. Okay. I remember the years I was there, the, uh, the football team, which is another highly ranked team, that for the first time they were looking to um, bring in a high school student who was black, who was a quarterback. Now we see a few black quarterbacks now, but during that era you didn't see black quarterbacks. And although he, this young man was the, the, the top ranked quarterback in the state of Louisiana, when they brought him to LSU, they told him he could not be a quarterback because they were concerned about it. Okay. Um, so, you know, again, when I look at that reality in that context, um, on the one hand, I'm not altogether surprised, okay? Um, but on the other hand, the, the outpouring, the way that people now are coming to critique this, you know, suggests that, that there is some change. But I never lose sight of the fact of how we got here in the first place, and you just cannot disconnect from the history. And I'll turn it over. Thanks, Wesley. Go ahead. Uh, I mean, I should have just paid her off. <laughs> Those are the, you know, that's, that's what really got me, I think. That's what got me for a minute. Because for those of you who hadn't heard, uh, his first public quote, Donald Sterling, after this whole fiasco was, I should have just paid her off. I mean, man, that, that guy's got some stones, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. to, to really stick to, to that kind of racism, to that kind of hate. I mean, you, get, you understand that 80 or so years old or not, this is an embedded, this is embedded in his brain. The gun to his head, America against him. He knows that he still believes what he believes. He still thinks it. He still thinks these black people don't belong at my games, even though talented ones are playing for the team that he owns. But it can't get out of his head. So in a weird way, do I fault him specifically? Or do I fault the culture that has taken over this America for years and years? Now, yes, on his own, this man was a problem. I mean, how can we let, not even just the team ownership, but uh, the NAACP was going to give him a second award, you know, for helping the black community. This is a guy who had racist allegations against him beforehand. 
You know, this is not some clean slate where this is the first time somebody. No, he's had lawsuits against him by Elgin Baylor. He's had lawsuits against him from people who were in his tenantship for his apartments. This was not a guy with a clean slate. You know, so I mean, there are certain things that David Stern, the ex commissioner of the NBA, should be put under because he let this go on. You know, this was this is not some surprise to a lot of people. A lot of people around him were just saying, "Well, this is what we knew," and they had to work to put this to bed. And it amuses me because <clears throat> in the NBA, sometimes for major trades, uh, the commissioner has to approve them. And a couple of years ago, Chris Paul, the talented point guard for the current LA Clippers, was going to be traded to the Los Angeles Lakers. Now, David Stern at the time vetoed that trade, being friends with Donald Sterling, and allowed the trade to go through to the LA Clippers right now because it was good for business. The only color that mattered to David Stern, as you so aptly told me, was green, right? That was all, you know. So when it came down to it, he vetoed that trade, allowed to go to the Clippers, basically gifting a better team to his friend, who was openly racist. I mean, this is a culture that went on, and it goes past just the NBA. I, I guess it puts me in a, in a state, almost in a state of fear, because as V for Vendetta has, has taught us, if you've ever seen the movie, you know, how do you kill an idea? How do you, how do you really put an idea to bed? And, I, and to be honest, I mean, you can't, because even thinking about logic, right? If I put an idea out in the world, and then you kill me, you guys heard my idea. Now it's in all of your heads. So what happens if we kill all of you guys? But somebody wrote it down in a book. But then next generations will see it. Just little subtle things. The ideas don't disappear. And that's a problem now. I mean, I, I don't even, I could go on and on about this. I really just looked up and uh, reading these things again. I mean, in my head I should be thinking, wow, how is this? Well, my first reaction was, how is this still, how is this still a thing? But part of it is, you know, what you were saying, where this is, it, it's where we've come from. I mean, I'm lucky enough to be born in a time now where there's a lot of progressive views, there's a lot of movements in the direction to fix this. But because of that, I've been slighted, uh, luckily, I've been slighted to see that kind of struggle and that kind of stuff. I didn't have to see the issues that went on, but I just have to understand, it's embedded in these people in the, in the minds. And this guy had to have a lot of something to think, in LA, which is an extremely diverse crowd, a diverse team, to still be thinking that, to still be thinking, this is it. You know, they're an it. They play for my ball team. They pay for my, you know, my, my salary. You know, I make money off the team, the profits. This guy had something. Uh, when we did this panel last year, and we did the whole, it was white supremacy in American sport. At first, I remember, I thought to myself, well, what was I going to say? Because the original idea was white supremacy against well, African-American, and I'm not African-American. But see, the idea of white supremacy still exists no matter where you look in these, in these ball games, in baseball and basketball and all this kind of stuff. It's disappointing because the owners were always making statistically a lot more than the players. For me, I remember the one number I brought up last year in baseball, Houston Astros were a horrible baseball team. The owner was still making about $79 million a year. Alex Rodriguez, who was the most paid baseball player at the time, was making about $30 million. So. Worst baseball team player, there's still a diversity there. The problem was, you look at the more richer owners, they're making maybe half a billion of dollars a year off their team, right? And you might think, all right, well, yeah, that's a business. That's how it works. Logically, yeah, you're right. Here's the problem. What was the color of all of those owners? The majority of the owners across many sports, basketball, football, baseball, three major American sports for a long time, has always been one thing, all of them. And you know, thank, thank God to guys like Magic Johnson who are trying now to put themselves in positions to buy teams and stuff like that, whether they have to be in a group or not. Because, and I'm not saying that, that African Americans and minorities have to own every team, but it's just a matter of diversity matters. You know, because this guy is saying these kind of things, that could be the predominant thought process. And we may not want to admit it. And it's just disappointing when you think about it, I guess. So I'm glad this got out, I'm glad of the reaction that I saw, but now it's, uh, well, what happens now? Because we're gonna get real angry about it now, we've got a panel together now, but what happens in six months? Are we gonna forget? I think that's where I stand. I'm worried about us forgetting. Well, I'll just take it from here. How, how about we get us a panel together and we get together the money and we buy the team this year? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you'll pick that up in just a second, but just so we have that fact, kind of a, the numbers here real quick. Uh, are, do any of you know exactly what the value of the team is? Now, I've heard 800 million. Is I've heard close to that. Okay, yeah. all right. It's 800 million. I heard 500 million, so it's 800 million. 
All right, I mean, so we're getting near a billion dollars, right? And I think he bought the club for about 13, 12 million. 13 million. Oh, 13 million dollars. It was a terrible. All right, so, okay. Yeah, just so that's in our head. Yeah. Go ahead, bro. Well, I'd like to touch on that. I mean, if I feel the Clippers, if they weren't so good now and in the playoffs, this probably would have never come to light. Mm -hmm. It's because, you know, this NBA team, the Clippers, is making a huge turnaround, bringing the city of L.A., you know, united now. And now, thankfully, you know, you know, he got busted, how about to say. And, you know, this is a man with a plantation mentality. He sees all his players as sort of like working under him. He takes the, I guess you can say he takes the, the idea of owner and just applies it to, you know, slave times. It's terrible. And now, you know, I'm glad that, you know, guys like Doc Rivers, a great coach, who's you know, basically supported his team's efforts to wear their jerseys inside out, to wear black armbands and black socks, Chris Paul, the leader of the Players Union, he said, listen, if this man isn't banned from the NBA for life, we're going to not play these playoff games. Yeah, we're going to walk right. off the court. Yeah. And you know what? The solidarity. Guys like um, Stephen Curry, guys like Kevin Durant, guys like um, John Wall, they was like, we're not, we'll go. We'll do it too. I mean, we do not want it in our games. Mm -hmm. And, <laughs> and, uh, and when you think about it, um, for more for for more reasons, I mean, David Stern. I mean, you point the finger at his you know reign as commissioner. It's very bad to look upon him that he basically gave you know Donald Sterling all the power and all the control. And you know, Irvin Magic Johnson was the target for this. He said, "Don't bring magic to to you know my games." Which ironically, enough, that's the house he built. He was the man. Yeah, Showtime. So it's just so. I, bad for the team and now um, um, Ron Harper when he went to LA you know it was considered like a death sentence going there because that's when your career is pretty much in, in a terrible position he openly made that clear and Donald Sterling suspended him without pay so I mean here's a player stating his mind and he gets suspended without pay so Sterling just again showing how he had that hammer it was just basically a tyranny in LA and now you know we're facing now this this united feel of like we are one basically we are one against that man against other owners who believe that because he so he um starts as he was telling me you know other owners probably think like this but the only difference is they wasn't caught on tape they wasn't you know basically publicized now and i think the nba is making good steps because adam silver i mean he was immediate and swift he said, banned for life. And now we're just like making progress and trying to realize, you know, great greatness in the NBA is what we need. You know, we need the Kevin Durant speech to be like, you know, promoted, not this. We need um, these playoffs, which has probably been one of the best playoffs in a, in a while. Yeah, and, I mean, there was like, almost every playoffs went to game seven in the first round. I was just, you know, that's what the NBA wants to strive for. You know, and starting with Donald Stern and getting him off is just the first step. We need to continue to see, understand, you know, ownership in general. Why is it only um, mostly predominantly white owners? I mean, why is it more black coaches getting hired where they clearly have great credentials? Lionel Hollins, I mean, he went to the conference finals last year, and now he's out of a job because they didn't want to pay him. Pretty much, that's... Um, and they have someone cheaper, basically, who's white. So, I mean, it's just um, Mike Watson who got fired. I mean, so is he going to get a job? Mark Jackson, he's moving the Golden State Warriors up, and he gets booted. In Oakland, for crying out loud. <laughs> <laughs> he gets booted. And, you know, they cited, which was, blew my mind, religious reasons. The man... To, He's too religious. Oh. <laughs> I'm like, dude, isn't that what you want in, in an Oakland area? Isn't that where you want, you know, guys to you know become leaders? I mean, Stephen Curry, his development, mostly because of Mark Jackson, and now you're going to take that away from him. You're going to see. It's going to damage, you know, that team, and people don't realize that. I mean, thank God, Doc Rivers was the coach. It was Vinny Del Negro. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> Vinny Del Folds under pressure. He's origami. Doc Rivers. <laughs> Doc Rivers. He stood strong. I mean, he get, he shared his story when he was growing up. His house was robbed and burned down. So he shared that story in this time, and he really, you know, helped unite this Clippers team. And 
you know, as an Oklahoma City fan, I don't, you know, I'm start like they're kind of like the bad guys in a way because like you know <laughs> the Clippers, right. you know, you want them to you know win to make this an ESPN thirty for thirty story. <laughs> <laughs> and now you know it's like, but you know, I want it. Let's put it this way: I wouldn't feel so bad if the Clippers beat my team. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Noah. That's beautiful. Yeah, well, well said, mm -hmm. Josh. Please. Thank you, sir. Um, Firstly, I'd, li I'd like to say that I, I think it's great that we've reached a point in our discourse where so many people are quick uh, and eager to criticize uh, bigotry and racism where, wherever it, it occurs. Uh, that, that's a great thing. And it, and it happened um, very quickly over the weekend before the pundits could get to it on Monday morning. Yeah, yeah they were um, and, and, and it seemed we were overwhelmingly against Sterling's comments. There's, there's no doubt about that. And then Monday, when the pundits got a hold of it, they were all overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly against what Sterling had said. Uh, and I, I, I was looking forward to hearing uh, what the right-wing media might have to say about it. Uh, and I was surprised, because the usual ones who, who come out and defend uh, comments like these, they, your Bill O'Reilly was uh, surprisingly good on it. Uh, Ann Coulter had an interesting take on it that actually had more to do with the male supremacy than the white supremacy, <laughs> but we, we, we've got to shift things around a little bit, I suppose. She's got to do something interesting. Um, but what I, what I find so fascinating is that we're, well, we're not doing what Dr. Dr. Nanfi did here now, and, and we're not looking at the actual content. We're not actually, we weren't that weekend actually listening to what he said. Um, and I don't think it was the vitriolic racism that we've, uh, that we've been accustomed to. And I think what we've reacted to has been sort of that kind of vitriolic racism that we've seen over the course specifically of the last two presidential terms, maybe the last six to eight years. Um, I'm, I'm arguing that Donald Sterling isn't the dangerous, no, he's been, I'm sorry. His dialogue uh, in that recording isn't the dangerous racism that we're accusing it of being, that we're saying that it is. Um, I, I think we've jumped on a red herring here on this one. Um, and that was my concern as far as the right-wing media goes. I thought that they would have something here that they could, they could really attack and say, we've got them now. We, we, we told you, the race baiting. We got them. Um, and they, they, they didn't do that because they couldn't this time. It, 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 it had gone that far. Things have gotten that far out of hand as, as far as the the conversations that we're having, the, the racist culture. Um, but I think this was one that they could have if they, if they chose. He, he, he isn't being a malicious racist in this. He doesn't actually say anything against anyone. He uses cold language, sort of, with the it, if, if, if you want to play around with the it. But he actually says that Magic Johnson should be admired. And he isn't aware of the, the recording. That's, that's just his honest feeling. Magic should be admired. You know, she's doing the recording here. She's doing, she's doing all of the leading, and he isn't involved in any of that. Um, these are the words kind of of a, of, 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 a, of, a, of a sad old man out to police a young girl's Instagram account. And surely there's racial elements in it. A absolutely, there's no, there's no question. But when he says, don't bring it to my games, he isn't saying that I don't want black people in my games. He's aware that he has black players. He, he, he's aware that he has a black audience. But when he says, don't bring it to my games, what he's saying is, do me a favor, don't embarrass me. Which, which is sad, pathetic, and racial. But he's saying that I'm aware that I, have, uh, that I have racist peers. And there are people who see you, my girlfriend, my right hand, whatever it is that he calls her, uh, there are people who see you at my games, uh, and you're, you're representative of me. And I'm embarrassed um, in front of these people. These, these, these people are influential, and I recognize them to be racist. And I'm not saying that he, that he isn't racist. I, I, I happen to believe that there, there's something racist about him. <laughs> Let's say that. But, he, but he, isn't, he isn't this hostile bigot that we're painting him out to be. And I, I know that sounds like a defense, it isn't. My, my, my thing, my concern is that we begin to, when we don't analyze it and we jump to that extreme, um, we, we sort of give them ammunition on the other side. 
and we give them the opportunity to say that, oh, look, they're race baiting. Um, you, you, you give them the opportunity to say they're creating an issue out of nothing, or racism doesn't, doesn't exist, the usual things that they say. And this time we're actually, I feel we're actually on the wrong side of it, that, that we've taken a win with the wrong issue. And I, I simply wish that it had been something else. And um, I, 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 hope, I hope that we don't sink to that level, that we stay out of that territory, out of winning arguments with, 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 with sort of a bad situation that doesn't work for our agenda. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Brother White. Hey. OK. Um, I um, really appreciate uh, what everybody said. Um, and I would just say amen to what's already been spoken. I will respectfully disagree just a little bit because I do think Donald Sterling is extremely dangerous. I think the situation is extremely dangerous. But the, the part of the danger is the superficial level at which he's being analyzed. So I guess in the few minutes, I don't want to talk too long, but in the few minutes I have, maybe I can explain some of this. And I've just, Talk about great quick notes. Um, I want to talk about three things. One, intimacy. Um, the need to demystify power. And the mythology of the self-made man and all of these connections. And to me, Donald Sterling and people like him connect directly to Kevin Durant. And I'm going to get to that in a minute. Um, first, in terms of intimacy. Um, as a former lawyer, when I listen to this tape, and I haven't heard all of it. It doesn't seem like entrapment at all. So I don't see V. Stibiano leading him anyway, just asking him about something. I want to say that up front because she's being vilified right now, and I think completely unnecessarily. Because it, it, who she is, what she does, is irrelevant to this discussion. So to me, she is, I mean, I don't know if you saw it today, they've got these mug shots of her from some arrest in 2004 and then from uh, uh, a DUI in 2010. And you see how her face has changed and it, you know, she looks really sinister and mean. It's like, come on, man. So clearly they're trying to use her as this uh, distraction. Uh, some people are trying to use this as a, a distraction. I do think that's going to be one of the responses. But it's the intimacy, I think, that's important in their relationship that they're talking because for him, in some ways, this is personal. Again, exactly what you guys said. This is personal about, don't embarrass me. Don't embarrass me. That's very clear. Don't embarrass me. But the other level of intimacy that has to, to me, has to be explored is the complicity of the former commissioner and the other owners. I, to me, there's, there's no way, no one knew this happening. I lived in Los Angeles for five years in the late 80s, shortly after you know, the team came there. And almost immediately you heard these stories. The, the first coach he had, Paul Silas, is a black guy who played with the Boston Celtics during their heyday in the 60s. And Sterling comes up to him and says, well, can't you, uh, in addition to coaching the guys, can't you wrap their ankles and you know, give them ice you know, before and after the games? And Silas is like, I'm a coach. What are you talking about? I'm, I'm not a trainer. I'm a coach. We got white people to do that. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably what he should have said. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then during Silas's tenure as coach, uh, uh, Sterling, who I think uses the club as a way to satisfy his own personal predilections, this is how he meets young women, he was known for taking many of these young models that he would meet into the locker room after the game while the guys are showering and naked. Mm. And I witnessed his saying, yeah, this is what he said to this woman. Look at all those beautiful black bodies. Yeah. This is what this man is saying. So there's, there's something around intimacy, about, around white supremacy, that again, going back to the Professor Gregory's point, should not shock us. This is a plantation. This is a plantation where bodies work, they make you money, but they also are there for various purposes, whether it's to elevate you or to admire, like you know, uh, animals in a zoo you know, or cattle on a ranch. Uh, and so I think we have to examine that. And to me, the complicity of the owners, uh, I mean, they've gotten a free pass. And uh, as far as the NBA's response, I think it's, it's better than I expected, but it's not enough. Because I think, yeah, they should force the sale, but they should claw back all the money. They should give him his $13 million and say, bye. We're taking everything else. You don't, you don't this is ill-gotten gain. We're disgorging you entirely from it. Uh, the second thing in terms of demystifying the process, I think 
part of the issue in terms of white supremacy, but also in terms of power, and perhaps Professor Gregory could back me up on this or correct me where I, where I stray, but I think one of the biggest problems is around the issue of innocence, is the notion that by being white, you are naturally innocent, that there's, there, you don't have any malice in your heart, you didn't do anything wrong, you're not a normal human being who comes to things with your own biases, your predilections. So white supremacy eliminates that and says that you're innocent. So we have a hard time criticizing white people or having other people even acknowledge our criticism because they say, oh, no, he's a nice guy. He gave a million dollars to the LA chapter in the NAACP. What are you talking about? He's a great man. You know, it's like, you know, he's, he's dating this Mexican, African-American girl. You know, how can he be racist? I'm like, oh, please, uh, somebody talk about Thomas Jefferson and Sally Bennett for a minute. Somebody, somebody, say something about that. You know, so, I, so at, at one level, we, we, we have the issue of innocence, but we also have the issue, again, of, of people in power. Um, there are some emerging scholars in psychology who are saying that when they do tests, they find that people who are tremendously wealthy and powerful are almost sociopathic in their behavior. Uh, they feel tremendously entitled. They don't feel as if they have to, to answer to anyone at all. So we're not even talking about regular human beings who might have empathy for one another <laughs> as you pass them on the street or in the hallways. And, and, but we don't want to say that. And we're in a period now where we esteem wealth. We esteem people who own basketball teams or own large corporations. And so to me, it's going to be important, I think, as we hopefully moving, moving on with this or the next guy that comes up or Jim Ursay with the Colts who got busted for marijuana and $27,000 of cash. If he was black, he'd been in jail. Mm. You know, and they'd say, oh, he's, a, he's not just using the drug, he's a dealer. With mm. that amount of cash, please. Under, so, under, man, under the jail. Yeah, under the jail. So we need to demystify Sterling. And I think one way to do it is to... to to, to use humor, but it also use very graphic images. And so when I think of Donald Sterling, I think pimp. He's a pimp. And that's what we need to call him. He's a pimp in the collection of other pimps. And we need to talk about them in this way. And not sit there and go, oh, wow, you know, he made all this money. How did he make it? He's a slumlord. He graduated from law school, bought a few really cheap apartment buildings, charged over, overly high rent in L.A., flipped them, kept flipping them, kept flipping them. He's a slumlord. This is what he is. And as an owner of a team, there's nobody that goes to the Staples Center to see him. Not one person. Not one person. But the attitude is, oh, you go out there and get my paper. That's my, I, I give you cars. I give you houses. I give you clothes. But you go out, that's, that's my money. That's my money. You go out there and get my paper. So that's just one thing that occurred to me. Maybe you guys can come up with your own. But I think we need to just completely dem demystify it. And the final thing that I would say is that there are no self-made men. Uh, going again back to what Professor Gregory said uh, around our history. Uh, and one of the things that's very common, particularly for rich people, is we're taught, oh, it's through their own hustle and hard work that they, 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 they made their millions, they made their fortunes. Donald Sterling made his fortunes off the backs of very poor black and brown people in L.A. That's how he got wealthy. And to me, that's the connection in part to Kevin Durant. So when Kevin Durant is talking about his grandmother struggling to raise him and his brother or his mother, they're talking about conditions that are very similar to ones that Donald Sterling created in his apartment complexes and through his process of racial discrimination and housing. So the reason that we have gangs or we have all these other problems can be connected to this discrimination, it, it's historic. And to me, it's tremendously dangerous because we want to pretend like, oh, we need a raging bigot to prove that racism is still here. No, no, you don't need that at all. You need very quiet, rational people who are willing to justify the racist, sexist things that they do and their friends to go along with it. And it survives. He doesn't have to put on a clan hood. He doesn't have to say the word nigga. And everybody's like, oh, he's cool. No, he's not. This is the, these are the people that shape policy, whether it's economic policy, public policy, political policy. This, he's extremely dangerous. All right? But again, for me, part of the issue is like, and I agree with you, why, let's not just talk about Donald Sterling. All right? To me, it's almost like the Barney's case, whether the uh, black folks are stopped at Barney's. 
Mm -hmm. Right? And so people want to talk about, oh, is that fair? Is that right? You know, is it justified? What's Jay-Z going to do? Fuck Jay-Z. I don't care what Jay-Z does. <laughs> no, seriously, I don't care what. What about the 98% of white people who shop at Barney's? What about them? Do you really feel like we should not ask them? Do you have a choice to make? Are you willing to continue to shop in a store that does this to uh, your fellow citizens? To me, that's the question that never got asked. And it's not going to get asked here unless we press it, unless we can continue asking it. So, so yeah, I, I would just disagree slightly that I think he's tremendously dangerous. And this, this attitude is tremendously dangerous. So, I'll stop it. Thank you, Thank you, brother. Uh, thank, you. thank you so much. Uh, I, I, like as Brother White has done, I will simply build on what's been said, and then we can all beat up Josh. <laughs> uh, by the way, I, I did not vet any of these. Uh, I haven't even talked to Brother White about this yet. We usually are right on it, you know. Uh, 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 my wife is here actually. She, she calls you the, the, you know, the guy in the State Farm commercial at three in the morning. <laughs> Who are you texting? <laughs> George, what is he wearing? <laughs> <laughs> Who's George anyway? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, uh, I'll, I, I might pick up most directly on something Dr. Gregory said uh, and put it this way. Uh, the, the paradigm, the, the belief system, the way we know what we know, uh, the paradigm of, of white dominance as the common way of understanding the world is changing rapidly. The response of the NBA players to Sterling's comments is a representation of that change. The athletes in a major American sport took a correct stance against white supremacy as a group by threatening to walk out. We have had extraordinary individuals, some have been mentioned, uh, uh, who have demonstrated courage and political consciousness over the years. I'm thinking of Jack Johnson, Muhammad Ali, uh, Jim Brown. Jackie Robinson, in an interesting sort of way, certainly. Uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, whose image we had on the, on the wall here. Venus and Serena Williams, certainly I would put in that category. Yes, I see you, Sister, sister, sister Atlanta. <clears throat> um, Arthur Ashe, uh, among many others. They were all incredible athletes who were also devoted to something higher than themselves, and all of them were distinctly alone in their fight against injustice. Frederick Douglass was right. He said, Famous speech. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. Find out just what any people will quietly submit to, and you have found out the exact measure of injustice and wrong which will be imposed upon them. And these will continue till they are resisted with either words or blows, or both. The limits of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance of those whom they oppress. Close quote. Organizations like the NBA rarely take concrete action against racism unless their profit is threatened. I thought that Adam Silver's statement was significant, powerful, appropriate, and supportive of the black players in the NBA. I also think he would not have acted powerfully if he had not been forced to. In my opinion, he made a strong statement to avoid an unacceptable consequence. Do I think Donald Sterling being kicked out of the NBA? And by the way, taking uh, millions with him, resulting from the sale of his team, I I, I want to ask Brother White about the legal. Uh, can we can we attach these assets? You know, <laughs> that's, that's a question I have. Uh, maybe we'll get to that in a second. Um, taking millions with him, uh, resulting from the sale uh, of of his team. Do I think that his being kicked out of the NBA is as important as Rosa Parks launching the civil rights movement in Montgomery, Alabama? No, I do not think so. The NBA is still a powerful cartel, and it will continue to make money for the owners and for corporate interests. In the end, this is just a tiny blip in the struggle to deconstruct the vicious insults of white supremacy. But the player's response represents an important step in the development of political consciousness among a young group of black men who have the potential to make even more significant contributions with their wealth and position. Frankly. I was amazed by the response of the athletes. Professional athletes don't usually stand up collectively for their dignity. They demonstrated that they have a sense of self-worth and consciousness, as well as an ability to express themselves collectively in the face of insult. 
a smile across my face when one after another the players came out saying decisively, this guy's got to go. Charles Barkley, Shaquille O'Neal, <laughs> Magic Johnson were unequivocal in their outrage as they demanded that Sterling be ousted from the NBA. I was and am immensely proud of all of them. Thanks. Um, I think we have, uh, uh, Dr. Gregory has to leave in, uh, in just a few minutes, so if anybody has any specific question for her, it would be great if we get those questions first. Uh, and, uh, I mean, you know, whoever, I mean, I can. She's always so polite. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying if anybody got it out, <laughs> uh, specifically there, but then of course we will, we will open it up and we are very uh, eager to hear your comments and questions. Uh, uh, please, brother, you can get us kicked um, uh, I, 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 Very good. Um, I want to ask you a question in terms of that quote, second quote. I'm living in a culture and I have to live within the culture. Mm -hmm. um, is Sterling referring to the hegemonic culture that you that you? Oh, that's a very, it's a very interesting question. <laughs> and would you like to explain to you, Minnie what we mean when we talk about the hegemonic culture? Um, okay, the hegemonic culture basically is the the culture where rich, white, people are part of where it's just a very few, not too many, and they don't allow a lot of people to, to enter into that culture, you can say, and they control it like, you know, through politics and through industry and what have you. So. I mean, you, you raise a very good point, Matthew, and of course when we talk about the hegemonic culture, um, and Matthew's talked about this in the other classes that I've taught, the hegemonic culture is fluid, it changes, where you, depending where you are in the world. And even if think about a country like the U.S., so um, if I were to go to Utah, the hegemonic culture is also going to be not just male and wealthy, it's also going to be largely Mormon. I come to New York City, the Mormon part gets thrown out. So hegemonic culture, it's very particular about what it likes <laughs> and what it doesn't like. And it also is, you know, very heterosexual. So, so I mean, it's, what's very clear is that not every being a man, being white, doesn't grant you entry into the hegemonic culture. Um, that wealth and power are crucial. And I think, you know, as what some of you have been talking about, this is this is a much bigger issue. Okay, that who else within his hegemonic culture is he concerned about that he has to please? Okay, that he has to make sure he fits the model. You know, it doesn't mean just merely being rich, male, and white makes you a racist, certainly, okay? But clearly, he's very much concerned about his ability to maintain, to fit in the ideal hegemonic culture. And you, you point out something very, yes, interesting. Um, and the fact that he says it. You know, the fact that he says it. Um, and again, I think what's, what's so strong about this, um, and again, not, you know, I think you do raise a good point that, you know, sometimes one can be very eager to, to criticize things. We don't know the story, but it's what we more we know about this that the subtleties are actually very dangerous. Mm. I mean, as George said, and as I tell my students, I put these words in quotes. The fact that he's not saying nigger this nigger that, you know, that doesn't make it any less worse. Yeah. Okay, I <clears throat> mean, I know some folks who have racist views, but they've never kept, they've never discriminated against folks to the point of $2.75 million that this fella has, <laughs> okay? So it is often that subtlety. And the he when Matthew mentions the hegemonic culture, the beautiful thing about pa power is you can be as subtle as you need to be. Mm -hmm. You don't have to make the big, bold statements because of who you are. Your words speak volumes. It's one of the reasons why the little the other side is the owners the other owners are kind of upset with Sterling right now because he just outed them all. You know? Yeah, he, he exposed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, well, just one thing, uh, Sister Gregory, on uh, the the two point seven five million dollars. Can you clear that up? Well, I think some of you folks may have read that um, Donald Sterling was sued um, for housing discrimination against blacks and, and uh, Latinos in Los Angeles to the tune of $2.75 million. That's what he had to pay out. Yeah. Uh, Keeping people out of, as, as you mentioned, a lot of the house, the complexes that he built, he didn't want certain people. And you talk about material benefits and discrimination. 
I mean, you know, certainly the, the, the fellows in the NBA, I mean, you know, monetarily, they're not hurting, but it's, as you said, those rank and file folks mm -hmm. who pay the real price for this. Yeah. Um, well, am I right that that was a settlement? that he, yeah. in order to avoid, yeah. yeah, that's what he had to pay out uh, in order to avoid uh, more serious, uh, yeah. Uh, and this was buildings that he owned in Los Angeles and, and he was making life hell for uh, the black and Latino residents and even saying they can't even live in my building. Yeah. Uh, so thank you for that. Can I, can I put you on the spot, Josh, just for a second? And in the, on the quote that the brother uh, brought up there, I'm living in a culture and I have to live within that culture. How do you define that word culture in that quote? I'm just curious. And this is not to, to you know, beat up on him as I joked before, but I'm just curious, given what you were talking about, about, about that code language you were saying, where he's not saying, he didn't say I'm living in a white supremacist culture. Now, a lot of us here believe that's exactly what he was saying. And, uh, but, but he didn't use that word, as you were pointing out, right? He used the word, I'm living in a culture. It's sort of a side deal, right? Um, uh, go ahead. No problem. Take your time. Yeah. Uh, he has to go set up his class real quick. He'll be right back. Um, but what do you, how do you define culture right there, Josh? For Sterling? In, yeah, what do you think he's saying? when he says that word culture. What Sterling is, is, is saying is, honey, you know I've got a lot of racist friends, uh, and, and, and they've been calling me. You, you know they've been calling me, and I don't need it. Um, you, you, you know what this is. Now, I need, I need you to behave so that I don't look bad in front of my buddies. It's precisely what he's saying. Like, he, he's telling her, you know the world. You know we live in a racist world. Um, it, it, it's interesting, though, that he doesn't that he doesn't cross the line and say that, as you said. Um, that he says we're living within a culture. Mm -hmm. Do you all remember you took that class? Did you take my Black Lit class? Yeah. No, well, how many of you have read W.B. Du Bois' Souls of Black Folk? Uh, important text. You all need to read. I'm shocked that not a single hand gone up in this room. Uh, okay. <laughs> 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 Coleman's picking up all of you. In the, in the forethought, uh, the introduction to the book, he says, uh, and needless to say, I am bone of the bone and flesh of the flesh of those that live within the veil. In other words, he identified himself with black people, saying, I am black, I am one of the oppressed. Here, Donald Sterling identifies himself as one of the white race. He, he actually, uh, the word I am, li and I have to live within that culture. He puts himself in the white supremacist culture of exploitation and insult, uh, rather directly. Uh, so I, I thought that was that's an interesting sort of close reading of that quote uh, as well. Please, sister, yes, take oh. us into, take us someplace important. Oh, raise my <sighs> this is not directed especially to you, Dr. Gregory, but I would like to also hear your response while you're here. Did everyone on the panel hear the entire tape? I did. The, the nine Twelve minute, minute. I heard the ten minute. This is slightly ten longer minute. version. Mm -hmm. Some kind of mm -hmm. was that these, the part that these exact quotes are from. Mm -hmm. I think it's very interesting. I watched you type these, and I'm like, I know he's not gonna put in the quote that resonated most with me. Mm -hmm. And it's been not, it hasn't even been in this, the discussion at all. Mm -hmm. And- It is now. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, of course, because it's always skipped. And then you said, I don't know who you said spoke about the male supremacy, but you said it, like a like a joke. That's how I heard it. Uh, and Coulter's. Uh, you said it, but you said, of course, that's where she went with it, kind of. I don't know your exact. To try to be words. interesting, I think you said. But that's directly into the old poor man. This is personal. It's a relationship that he's in with a woman, and as the male in that relationship, he says, "You can do whatever you want. You can admire him. You can fuck him. You can do whatever you want in private, but not in public." She's like, but these, these are my people. I am black. He said, I thought you got rid of that. Mm -hmm. She's like, I'm black mm -hmm. and Mexican. Thought you got rid of that part. You are a delicate Latina woman mm -hmm. in public. You are a delicate white woman in public. But when you do this, I can't, I can't keep up that lie. That's what he's saying. He's like, I want you as my girlfriend as a white woman because that's how you look to him. So th the way you're saying it, as if he's not complicit in the racism, he specifically, com he's like, you can be here because you're white enough. But if you hang out with the black people, I can't pass you off as white. Now, you're, now it's private. I mean, now it's public. 
privately. He said your mother can come, your sister can come, but don't bring the black guys. In a, as a jealous boyfriend, don't bring the black guys. As a white supremacist, don't bring the black guys. Don't bring the black guys in public. I can't explain that one away. I can explain. If I can have you as my mistress in front of my white, my white friends, my rich white friends, my people in power. That's perfectly fine. You can, he says you can fuck the black guy. I don't care. But just don't bring them in, out in public. Not saying everyone else I know is racist, but I'm not. He's saying, I can't, that's not who I am. <laughs> May I have your permission to, to add a, what I feel is a layer to that? Yes. Um, the gender issue has is, been kind of pushed down here. I was sitting here thinking about the uh, opening chapter in Invisible Man called Battle Royal, where he has these black boys fighting in a, in a, in a ring, mm -hmm. and they bring out a naked white woman. And some of the black boys get erections, but they know they can't react to her because you know what happens to black men who react to white women. So you have, uh, um, you have a white Mexican black woman who's, <laughs> who's been pushed way down in this. This is, this is very much about how we deal with, with gender issues in this, country, uh, in this country also. Black women have historically been victimized by powerful white men, and it, it, it continues to go on in lots of ways. There was a time in history when black women in the South could not go into a hotel at all because it was assumed if they went in, they were prostitutes. So the, 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 the playing of the image of this woman is white when she needs to be, she can be Latino in the middle when she needs to be, and she can be black when she wants to be. This whole gender thing is, has been minimized by all the press, and it's even minimized in, in this discussion. And I think it's an important part of what's going on here. So with your permission, I wanted to add that to your yes. comment. No, Dr. Greer, you probably have to go quickly, but uh, any anything I you mean, can build you, on you, that? Your name, I'm sorry. Alexis Haney? Alexis, I mean, you're absolutely correct, actually. Um, the, in this case, the issue of, you're right, gender really is not far away. It's not very far away. I mean, it's very much a part of the, the social construction of race and the social construction of sexism. And so by const constructing her on the one hand, um, you know, he's, he's set this, this line where she she adheres to a particular standard of beauty. And when he uses the term, you have to say a delicate. delicate. I mean, that, that also just to emphasize, you're Latino, eh, but you're delicate, so we can construct you as appropriate, especially when we move into my culture. Okay. Um, and so, you know, what, what, what that sort of language would be used if we were talking about, you know, a different type of sexual relationship, probably not. And once again, I mean, as you point out so correctly, the, the construction, and it's, I'm not saying that certain women don't also play a role in this, but the construction of the female body is essentially something that is primarily something sexual. Because a lot of this certainly is about who she's hanging out with from a sexual standpoint also. It's not just merely that these are just my buddies, we come to the game. It's, well, I mean, as you say, quote, you know, you can fuck whoever you want to. That's also a component of this. And if there's this where you were talking to, say, some of his delicate or not so delicate black Latino young men's position, I don't think he'd be having the same kind of conversation with them. So kudos to you for definitely bringing up something that you're right. And it does often get to get kind of swept under the rug. Thank you. Kick it out of our Please. Um, I mean, I may get in trouble for some things I'm going to say because it's really off my opinion. But uh, it's funny because racism and sexism, that's a no-no, isn't it? You're not supposed to bring them together. You're not supposed to talk about them at the same time. I just think it's, it's, it's funny because, see, here, here's, here's what's beautiful about, and forgive me for saying, here's what's beautiful about, about terrorist attacks. Here's what's beautiful about events like these. Unity. The unity after. Because I think what we struggle with as a country is unity. Because we can't, damn, get together on one thing. And when we do, we can change things, but we don't. We don't. And I'll give you an example. In this room, there's a good amount of students, right? Let's say we're all ticked off about tuition. Right? And we all sit there, yeah, yeah, tuition's a little bit too much, right? But then tomorrow there's a protest about it. How many of us are actually going to show up? And I say that as a criticism of myself as, as much as I do the student body. You know? It's not like I'm some kind of super rebel. Because I know I'm not. I think we, we struggle with unity. It's, it takes us an event like this, or it takes us a terrorist attack, or something like a shooting at a school, for us to be unified. But even then, it's just short. You know? And we have trouble focusing on multi like multi-part issues in this, because you're right, this is definitely a gender issue too. You're right in saying that. 
But people aren't going to talk about it because no, wait, the racism comes first, right? But it's not supposed to work that way. And it's funny because extremists are people who believe in different type of things always run into problems. And my, with extreme feminists, not feminists alone, extreme feminists who give feminism a bad name, you'll see some things where they come out and they say, oh, men are horrible, we should kill men. You know, that's not the view of real feminism. Because feminism looks for equality, I would say. I think, right? If you, because I, 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 I know you also are very, but I, they, they look for equality. Destruction of male supremacy. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that, Which I, results in equality. <laughs> I accept that too. But I would say that if I go to any, uh, if I would go to the uh, regular feminist or an average feminist, any feminist out of the group, they're not really looking to like murder all men or something. It's not looking for like an only female plan, I would say. Can I right? please interrupt you? Please go ahead. Kick in. Because this qualifier, you keep adding extreme feminism, but we don't say extreme anti-racist, okay, you, don't, sorry, you don't make that qualification. Would you say they're not feminists? Because I can, I will adapt my... But the word feminist always demands a qualifier. What kind of feminist, feminist are you? They never say, what kind of abolitionist are you? Mm, do you want to kill the white people? <laughs> or do you just want to be equal with them? Or do you want to... Fuck? You don't have to do that with racism because it is agreed all around the board. But as a male, you automatically don't have that... Ex you have an extreme qualification to it because of a fear of loss of power, which you also possess. Would you agree? Uh, what would you prefer me to address that? Because I, I will accept your... Well, you, I don't, you, you don't accept my own. Yeah, you yeah, have to <laughs> no, because I don't think... <laughs> yeah, I know, it's just thing, right? I talk to different people who believe, and some people will say extreme feminists. Some people will say they're not feminists. You know, that's not feminism. And it's not even feminism the worst way. Like, I'm, I'm an atheist, and we run into that too. People will tell me extreme... It's not the same issue, I'm aware of that. But we get extreme atheists, right? They're like, oh, we're trying to take down religion, you're trying to... Again, you know, I understand that you guys have more of a struggle, but... I, you we, guys. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's just not, yeah. No, but, but no, really what... But the question of the issue for me is that I think we have issues focusing on multi part. If, yeah. if we can direct it to that, yeah. I will say. Yeah, yes. but you, if we have issues where it's like if we have racism and sexism together, we have these fights where we try to put one above the other and suddenly it dominates. You know? And it, it's bad in a way because when you say it's a gender <laughs> issue, you are 100% correct. And I'm then not if someone says. Issue. No, but part of it is a gender issue, isn't it? Well, like, I'm not part of it is a. Gender. I'm saying the person in control. Mm -hmm. That is a part of his control. Okay, fair, yes. Which is over females, not, not a gender <coughs> issue. I'm not. Fair, I'm, no, not, no, 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 I'm, I'm sorry saying for this is a name. part of it. Mm -hmm. This is the part of it because he did not come at her because she is black. He came at her because she believes she is white and she's hanging out with black people. As he said, I don't hate. When she was baiting him, she's like, well, I'm sorry that you feel this way about black people. I'm sorry that you are racist. He's like, I am not racist. I love black people, they're cool. You just don't do that. You my girlfriend who I can tell what to do. You my girlfriend who is a, like he said, an extension of me. Not equal to me, That's an extension, an image that I'm, I'm producing you as an image and I don't want it to include black people, especially black males. And then she said, I don't even know him personally. It doesn't matter, don't, don't present the image that you're standing next to this big black guy who you might be having sex with and I'm supposed to be your boyfriend. Right. That's what I'm saying. So you, but you do agree it's a multi, then you say at least it's a multi, it's, not, it's a it deeper be problem. It's a gender then. issue because there is a woman. No, I'm not saying gender, I'm saying it's a deeper, oh, okay. But it's, it's deeper it than. Is, it is a gender, there is a woman. Mm -hmm. There's, he's a male, they both have genders. And they're both a part That's of it. That's what you're saying. At this point, as the moderator, I'll suggest Thank that you, they Charlie. take this out in the parking lot. <laughs> 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 we'll, we'll let Brother yeah, Torres I'll kick in well, on this question. I mean, I think this issue of identity is a, a major issue with dealing with the female involved. I think she really doesn't know what she wants to be. Because there's an image of her wearing a visor covering her face. Where it's kind of interesting. She, she's supposed to... I don't think it's hiding from paparazzi. I think it was deeper than that. I think she's trying to hide herself as a black woman. She's trying to ask her Donald Sterling, her boyfriend, which is terribly an unhealthy relationship, said, get rid of that. <laughs> and I think, in her mind, she thinks she has to. And I think that's the issue I think Alexis is trying to bring out. Why is this woman trying to get rid of her identity? Why is she taking out pictures from Instagram that proves that she's a black person? Why, is she, why can't she take pictures, pictures that define identity? Why is she forced to like, take them down? is the issue with her. And I think she's trying to like comply with that identity that Mr. Sterling wants to have, which is obviously wrong. 
And I think it's kind of interesting. He allowed, I mean, there's, she's been quoted as saying, oh, I, li I let him call me silly rabbit. At, that's a term of, in, that's, that's, a, that's basically demeaning her. Basically, he, and she lets it happen because I think she doesn't know how to combat it. I think she's really much someone who's a fragile mind, someone who, who's not strong mm -hmm. to combat this kind of thing. I, I honestly believe that. And I feel like also she doesn't see that she's being objectified. Donald Sterling, he goes proudly to the game in the front row with her by his side saying, yeah, this is my girlfriend. Like he said, Sterling does this before. Look at all these black bodies. Another example, look at this woman's body that she's delicately proud of. But he says she's proud of. I don't think she is. That's what I'm trying to get at. Okay, we got to let Alexis respond yeah. one more time, and then I'm we'll sorry, open it up for another question. Okay, you've, you've raised the, uh, clearly you've raised the right point. So Just like when you said you Go bring, ahead. when something like this happens, you bring all these ideas to the surface, and you don't know that they're embedded until you hear them, because I can't hear what you think until you say it. And then I say one thing, and then I hear this is what you think, which is scary. Just like you, this white man thinks this, and it scares you, Everything you guys just said is really scary. But wouldn't you agree that she's someone that's an um, easy target? She's I'm not sorry. very. I mean, she, she's using an alias as V Stavino. That's not even a real name. Oh, she doesn't I know her name. Like, can she? Oh, I, think, I think she's pretty damn smart. She recorded him. She's <laughs> profiting. She does whatever she wants and she exposes it to the world, but she doesn't have an identity. That would be saying, but when the players do it, the players are not complicit. But he did it as Chris Paul. He didn't do it as CP3. I mean, he was the man of the oh, let, let's, let, let's let Brother, I think, okay, let's why let, can't let's let brother Anthony brother. kick in why on can't this. Why can't we be tell you this? Go ahead, brother. All right, I'm, I'm just going to say, I'm a pig, and I know I am. I'm trying to get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, one of my best friends, she's like liberal feminist. She's trying, you know, when I say things, and she's like, know that you're saying these things? Obviously I don't. She's just like a white man that like is racist and does know he's racist. I'm trying to combat these things. So if I say something offensive, I apologize. But, um, like one of the things that like when you're talking about extreme stuff like, like those things do exist, but the way that it's framed, like it makes women sound like they're crazy. Like when you say extreme, it's like crazy. And then we qualify with all well, women are emotional and stuff like that. And there's a segment of feminism where they're like, you know, women are like, there are differences between men and women. We acknowledge those things, but our differences don't make us less. They just make us who we are. And I think that like, we have to acknowledge that like, women are women. <laughs> Counterparts men. Because they were socialized to be so? Yeah, excuse me. What did you mean no. when you said she was smart? What, what exactly did you mean by that statement? Well, well, because people are, people are saying that, that this woman is naive, that she's... Uh, you know that she she's she she like she's the victim in in, in all of this, and uh, I mean maybe she she's lost her dignity, but he lost his team, and she seems look the fact of the matter is is I think that as much as we'd like to think that this multi billionaire had all this power, he was deemed powerless by this woman who. You know, decided he told her to take their conversations. She didn't like go behind his back and say, He's an eight year old man. Is that a fact? Yes. Did we know she yeah. He, she said she had about 100 hours worth of. Where's the rest of it? Right. So, I think it was under the same thing. Yeah. Same thing. yeah. And, you know, my whole thing is, is that some of the assumptions that we make when you see a woman like her, with a guy like that, and start to objectify, oh, she must be doing this for this, and doing this for that, and it might be true, but to assume those things, it's wrong. You shouldn't make those assumptions just based on appearance itself. Like, you need to gather a whole picture and be able to put the puzzle pieces together. Like, the first time I saw her, of course there were things that came into my mind, and I said, hmm, like, I wonder why she did this, I wonder why she did that. But if you look for facts and you look for what's really happening, you start to, 
you start to understand the picture in, in its whole totality. That no, it's not that she's a gold digger. It's not that she decided to do this, this, and that, or that this guy's like a pervert. You know, like it, it's just it's very difficult to. Just when I heard them talking about feminine, like I thought like that and probably still think like that and use words and use statements that hurt women. And I think we need to be conscious, at least conscious, so we can be able to change our language because that language hurts. It, like, we, you know, it talks about male supremacy, it's a real thing. Like, it's a real thing. You know, and like I said, the segment of feminism that acknowledges that men and women are different, but those differences don't, it doesn't have to be a hierarchy. That those differences, oh, because I'm less emotional, I'm better suited to be in a position of decision making. Well, who's to say that emotion is not good in decision making? Like, who, who came up with that up? Like, you know, that doesn't mean anything. A woman is just as capable of doing anything as well as a man. Stop it. And, uh, and we, we are appreciative of Alexis uh, who has uh, intervened to make sure our language is uh, loving and affirmative. Can I just make one yes, go ahead. Less insulting. statement? Go ahead, and then Brother Bob will have to. Um, you use gold digger, and you use she's lost or doesn't have an identity, but when she's dating him and making a profit is what everybody is insinuating. And she. Now, I think this is what she, her profit is in catching him, right? I never even say him the date. I don't know. I, I can't assume that. I'm saying her relationship with him is one where she profits financially. Financial yeah. transactions. Yeah. 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 We all, that can be yeah. definitely. But it's not every black player on the court relationship with him profiting. And you say, he, we know he's racist. We know he's racist. And we all continue to, to play basketball for him. <laughs> but we don't say that those players do not have an identity, that they believe that they're, they're um, less than him, that they're ignorant of the situation. But you said that immediately of the woman. I think maybe she, she took it down, she did what he said, she listened to this man, she must believe that he is right. But she came out publicly and said, oh, I don't think he's a racist. She doesn't believe he's a racist. She said it publicly. I don't think he's a racist. I don't think he's that. I think he needs help. So she's sympathizing with him. She has come out and said that. So I think she's trying to still fit and stand by this man. Why is she completely standing by these statements? That's what I'm saying. There's a contradictory with her. Because she, she took the, lip, the courage to record this. But then she comes out and says, He's not what he is, and what we all have agreed that he is racist. So there's the, the issue I'm, I have with her. I, I don't mean to like, be anti-feminist or nothing like that, but what I'm trying to get at is like, why is she doubting what she recorded? That's what I want to get at. I want her to say he's a racist. Why isn't she saying it with us? That's what I want to know. Let's let Pablo kick in here. Uh, so yeah. far, everybody. We'll go, we'll go for a few more minutes. Uh, <laughs> so far, everybody up. has brought great points. The uh, issue of gender roles, sexism, rape, you know, racism, and all that. But I think this is on uh, a bigger scale. Can we all agree that this guy is just a bad human being? He's <laughs> 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 got all of it. <laughs> I've never seen a man that has so many bad qualities. It's, it's appalling to me. It's like he's a racist. Sexist. He's even underpaid his own white coaches. I mean, there's no bounds for this guy. He doesn't care about anybody but himself and his power. So this guy is just a bad human being. So. <laughs> or perceived power. Yo, yeah. <laughs> the right. thing is, though, it would be interesting what you said. His money, though. Wouldn't he profit off that by selling his team? Or can we? Yeah, yeah, I, I actually had that. I actually had that question. If you if you know the legal stuff on this, uh, brother it's White, it, it's uh, was is there some way we were trying to figure out if, if there was actually that two point five million fine is nothing. To yeah, no, that's no, not a problem, you know. But the 
but the the hundreds of millions that he will realize on this sale. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there was questions about possibly the IPO, uh, the, uh, mm -hmm. the it, along the lines of City getting involved and then running it like the Green Bay Packers are mm -hmm. own, where the fans own the team. Uh, there was a, this uh, the thing about uh, can we get a black uh, ownership group, you know, to to purchase but to seize the assets from the other sale, and you know. That is, do you know if any? We, we, well, the best we came up with is no, you can't. That this guy actually d does have the legal right to the money, and that we'll just be content to get him out of the league, you know, and that and that'll be significant. But do you have well, any idea, brother? The, the, I don't, I don't, I don't have any definite insight at all. Mm -hmm. But the the attorneys that that I admire and people that we know of that we've always admired were very good at coming up with very creative arguments. <laughs> <laughs> and so, to me, that's, that's where the energy has to be placed. Of approaching this, to me, the, the most obvious place to start, not necessarily the end, but, but through the best interest of the game clause that sports has used, these sports leagues have used that to defend everything, to shut Congress out, to essentially bypass all antitrust regulations, so to me, you could use the best interest of the game and an idea like eminent domain mm -hmm. and say, yes, we're disgorging you. This is ill-gotten game uh, because it's gone on so long. Uh, we feel it's necessary. We're going to give you your original investment back. Mm -hmm. But the, the, if you sell it for 800 million, then you get 13 back. We keep 783 or whatever it is. And the league keeps it, maybe does something with it. I don't know. Uh, but it was just, to me, in terms of justice, uh, because to me the, the, the issues around how do you create justice, how do you create um, uh, some sense of, of fairness or fair play that, again, going back to the housing discrimination settlement, he reaped hundreds of millions of dollars by engaging in, in, in racial discrimination with his tenants. And to get out of these accusations in federal court, he settled for 2.75. So to me, that's no justice. That's not justice at all. Uh, how to do it, I don't know. I don't know. OK, and oh, so let's, let's have two more questions. Um, also, he's a cheater, by the way. Um, yeah. Serial. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> two, two questions. Does the players, and even Doc Rivers, and all respect for man, do they have any blame in it? Because they kind of knew beforehand, before they took the jobs, that this guy was a known racist. There's been many. That's an interesting question. There's been many, you know, news stories, articles about this man being a racist. It was no secret. Mm -hmm. So, knowing that, and I, you got to know who you're working for. Do they have? A, it took this for them to stand up together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my, I know my short answer to that is, I'll take this. For now, you know, yeah. they, they, but but you're raising a well, great question. Just, um, Jamel Hill said that you know, sports analyst. He said that that's kind of a problem if they knew beforehand. Mm -hmm. It took this, so and also with this after this Oscar's over. Well, you know, what, let's what, deal with that question, okay. and then he'll come right back to you for that other one. Were you going to say something to that I mean, streak or directly to them? He was been grilling them about that. Like, if you guys, hope you guys not know about this, but it might be hard to know if you really don't hit the newspaper or something, like if you just sign a contract to play and never really interact with them. That's what they said. They say, they claim that they had no idea because they never really did research. You know, that actually wouldn't surprise me given the, I, I came up in the professional sports world as well. I played a little minor league baseball and uh, you know, they, the general consciousness of the athletes along a question like that would be very low. It really would take something like this world, Mo many of them are not reading newspapers. Uh, you know, I, I, these are some of the, at least in, like in the, the lower minor leagues, they're 18 and 19 years old. You know, I, I mean, yeah, it's a, uh, uh, but it's, it's you're, you're raising an absolute, very interesting, directly on that point, anybody? Uh, and then we'll cycle oh, back. Something. Yes, please. It was, um, it was publicized at the LA community, or that folks in LA know about his behavior. So, Everyone knew he was a racist. Anybody that travels in those circles, that's part of the, you know, the LA sports industry, whether it be you know, basketball, so forth, they know about um, Dominic Sterling, his racism, his um, behavior with, with um, housing, all of that. So even though younger athletes um, may not know and might have signed on with the team, it, his, it wasn't his, a secret. His, yeah, it, it was not a secret. It just wasn't addressed or wasn't public. And this put it um, at, a, at a public level, obviously, so that it could be addressed. I don't think anybody really knew what to do with it. 
consequences for you if you don't do anything about this yeah. you know so when, the, when you're in that position publicly then you got a different kind of question and I, by the way I know you had another question I'll try and get back to you okay uh, uh, but let Satish get back to you. It, it's funny man you know the statement like uh, don't bite the hand that feeds mm -hmm. it, it's it kind of like that for them I think because it, it's weird because you're right they do get a lot of slack the players do get a lot of slack and it's interesting to think about it because I sitting back here at my couch at home watching ESPN think, man, they should be doing more. But, you know, at the same time, I should admit, that's his job on the line, you know, and that's his reputation on the line. Because let's just, you know, speculate for a minute, and let's say there are a few more owners, because we can't prove it, but let's say a few more owners are racist among the NBA, right? I mean, I'd like to be, let's just I'm say. Just, I'm just, I'm just trying to know. I mean, yeah, right, because, no, but now that, that, let's say, you have one of, like, these star players, like, acting out, that damages your reputation if you're trying to go to other teams. You know, and I'm not saying that as justification for them not acting out, but I'm just saying that's real. I want to, uh, huh? Oh, I was saying that I didn't think about that. Yeah, because I, I'm not saying because I used to work with uh, the Mets and talk with these players, and uh, funny, it's just I, I don't want to sit there and be the defender of them because you can criticize them and say, man, they should have done more, and I agree with you because that was my first reaction. But it really, uh, I, I think it, we should at least give them the benefit of the doubt for a little bit to think they're putting their job on the line, they're putting their reputation on the line. And if you were to come at me and say, well, if they don't do anything, who will? Then, yeah, you can keep me quiet and you'd be right. But there is a lot of things going on in the mind of an athlete. It's real easy to be an activist when you don't have anything to lose. That's it, right? Like, for me, I can say this sitting down here because right now, I don't matter. And what am I going to lose? If you took a, Chris Paul, this guy's got millions of dollars. He's got a family. He's got a reputation. All this kind of stuff, you know? And he's the icon in the NBA because of where he stands as part of the player union. He's also that, State Farm. Yeah, that man's got a lot to lose. So yeah, and, you know, we lose State that. Form, State Farm kept them. They 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 cut, off, they 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 cut off the ties with the Clippers, but they, but they kept yeah. Clippers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. 
the, you know, the, the yeah, it's, <laughs> uh, you, you all are really hitting on an important thing here. Um, uh, well, actually, you know what, I'll, I'll keep quiet for a second. Let's get back to this, uh, this other question. Okay, um, see how everybody's united for this issue that aroused. Uh, there's an NFL team called the Redskins. <laughs> <laughs> we've made this mention before. Yes. Yes. You mentioned uh, <laughs> too much <laughs> time. Yeah. And we, the right Redskins, made it we wish we could. It's the equivalent of nigga mm -hmm. to a black man. Yeah. Or a black woman. Redskins, if anybody doesn't know, is what they used to call the Indians at way before inherited land before us. And we kicked them off and you know, we took over. Like we always do. Um, <laughs> This team is called the Redskins, and no one is hollering about it. I mean, it's a racial slur. Now, the arguments are because the community is not doing nothing about it, so why should we care? But if we care about this, which is racism, we should care about all racism. So if, we, if we're powerful enough to take this down, then we should be powerful enough to take that down as well. Because if we don't, we're hypocrites. I think Cosby, you were, you were, that was sort of what you were hoping that this would proliferate into some kind of much wider thing. Like in V for Vendetta when they all got on board, you know, yeah. in V for Vendetta, everybody got involved. It, 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 question, it questions our humanity. I always bring this always to our humanity. I know racism, race is important. I know gender roles are important, but it always goes a step higher to our humanity. We're willing to protect our beliefs and others, but when it comes to others' beliefs, which we know is wrong, we don't stand united. So it makes us hypocrites sometimes. So I just want to know how you feel about that. Yes, sir, and I'll get right to you. I just wanted to say three thank yous, uh, uh, and, and then we'll wrap up. It. We'll, we'll go for a few more minutes uh, and uh, try and get everybody who wants to say something in here. But uh, Professor Salek uh, has provided some light refreshment for us when we are complete. So thank you so much for that. Uh, very much appreciated. Uh, brother brother Kashfi Fahim uh, always helps out getting all this stuff up here correct. Because uh, I don't know how to do it. And, uh, and, and he, he does know how to do it, so we appreciate uh, him for that. And, uh, brother on the uh, camera, you got to remind me of your name again. I apologize. Ryan. Say it again? Ryan. Ryan? Ryan. Ryan. Sorry about that. Sukdale, right? Yeah. yeah, I apologize, brother. Uh, uh, for You're the man. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this is Ryan uh, Sukdale, and he, uh, he's been here many times filming these events, and, and he. And he still don't know his name. <laughs> very, I'm usually very good with names. You know, and, uh, it's a real screw up on that. You're right. You're absolutely right. But thank you, Ryan. I uh, really appreciate your re uh, documenting this stuff for us so we have a record of it. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's a, a, nice, a nice record. Um, uh, we got Irwin, and then we'll cycle right back to you, okay, for your other question. Please, Irwin. Right. Yeah. Um, in response to what you just said, thank you. We have power to bring them down, and we have power to bring them all type of religion. But that's not true because we don't know exactly um, the power behind this guy. Because if there's more of them, it means that it's a society or a secret society. Because white supremacy is a secret society. Yeah. And, and if one of them messed up, they have to pull back, not to reveal the secret what's behind it. Yeah. This, and this is the teaching of, of, of you know, America. It was built on that. Yeah. And, and this is the secret that they, yeah. they, they, they kept for so many years, not for, the, for the majority not to know why white racism has to be the, the foundation of public yeah. yeah. You know, it is an interesting question. Uh, let's say we, one of these creative schemes that, mm. that, uh, that our brothers came up with, actually looks like it's a real possibility would right now Adam Silver I am he has the votes to yeah. kick the guy out of the league he's got the votes mm -hmm. would he still have the votes mm -hmm. would that change in any way if it turned out that this guy was not going to realize the profit off of because then yeah, you start to get into the other the other guys you know and, and they, they start looking like what's coming down the pike for them you know I don't know the I hope I would like to think the answer would still be yes that he would still have the vote but it's a it's a good kind of question because of what you're yeah. talking about you know they're all knee deep in this oh yeah uh, uh, I think he would lose the vote so. really you do yeah uh, it's I interesting they, so that would change plow, the landscape it would completely if they plow back because I, I think they, the other owners and again speaking to Irwin's point about white supremacy as a club, the way that it survives is oftentimes by allowing these 
you know, people who get exposed stand out there, oh, well, that's just him. <laughs> He's just a bad human being, even though he was part of our other group of other bad human Culture, beings. Right. right, right. It's just him. And so he skates. But if you say, no, we, we're, we're going to disgorge your wealth because of, you know, it's ill-gotten gains because of you did these things, yeah, the, the other owners would panic. Because, I mean, they're, to me, only slightly better. Uh, they, just have, they may just not have that call. Yeah, no, that's exactly. the thing. They just may not be the ones who got yeah. caught. So I think the second has to do with the money there. You know, it's like, hold on a, a second. <laughs> Let's think this over again. Because you, you pointed out that maybe, maybe, that they made this move just to save face. You know, maybe they had to. You know, the league yeah, made this move. That. And there's a part of me that believes that. You know, that they, they were put, because what other option would anybody in America have accepted? You know, if they, if they came short of banning this man, the league would have been under so much fire that the NBA would have... And the players, you know, I believe the players would have walked. So that's the thing. The that was the automatic thing. So in terms of that the money situation, if that's creative and that makes sense, I don't know if they're bold enough to do that because that's a step further. And he's not... He doesn't need... Adam Silver doesn't need to take the step further anymore because he appeased the general public. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't need to do that anymore. If he does, that would be very impressive. Mm -hmm. But then goes the step of will he get the votes, and I agree with you. He won't. I don't think so. Question. Let's get some people who uh, haven't spoken, although I did say that... Uh, I'll, I'll go over here. Okay, thank you, brother. Thank you. Um, how are we doing for time? Okay, we're pretty good. We're actually okay. We can, we can go a little more. Um, please, we have not heard from you. Yeah, uh, just a quick question for you guys. Do you guys believe that uh, without the force coming from, you know, social media on this, yeah. do you think that the mainstream media would have took it and run with it the same way they do with, you know, with any other article? Because I mean, you you don't you didn't really see too many people outside of the the stadium, you know, protesting. It was it was as simple as hashtag freaking, you know, yeah. like that. So my question to you is, do you think that uh, without social media, do you think the the main the mainstream media would have took this and ran with it and just put it out there until you know everybody? Well, I think social wrong. media. I mean, for example, all of this was just recorded information and by TMZ. And they took it on good. Um, they took it. It could have been a hoax. It could have been stapled together. It could have been just like some way of fraud. But you know what? Is you know the content of this man's character it speaks so strongly that you take this kind of thing and you you validate it, and then you know it just comes out to life. Social media, you know, helps keeps that growing because everyone, no one took his side, and then that's something I want to like bring up. You know. Everyone could have just said, well, maybe it's TMZ, so let's ignore it. No. The content of this man's character basically made TMZ, which is like yellow journalism in a way, because it's kind of like, you know, paparazzi, <laughs> sneak around bushes and all that, made that seem, it, you know what, it's real because this man is so bad. And then social media, yeah, I agree. I mean, social media helps propel all of this. This is like a driving force where, you know, once one person tweets, everyone tweets. You know, once you get Magic Johnson to say, I'm never going to a Clippers game, guess what? A lot of people are gonna think, I'm not going to a Clippers game either. Yeah. So I think social media played a huge role in getting this out to the, to the public. So assuming there was no social media, do you think people would have been out there like, it's an interesting you know, question. If there was no there, social media, there. it would have been, I mean, it would have been different. It would have been real different because this is all recorded. Yeah. You know, this is you know not footage. So I think without social media's instant uproar, you would have just like harder. You'd have had to, you'd have had to get that reporter to like stand out yeah. front of Mr. Sterling's lawn and say, Mr. Sterling, a few moments of your time, but you would have had to get that kind of evidence. But with social media, it makes it so much harder to ignore. Really? But, but I think it, think it could think? still okay. happen, you know, because you know before when you have all these elements that are like a soap opera, you know, like the older man dating this younger attractive woman, and, and people like to follow it. Like before, that you had Lorena Bobby, you had other, other <laughs> yeah, and, and people still follow it. I mean, it's not the same, I guess, but it has all the elements. Look at this now. Now this is the the number one in the media, and I think it's not only because of what he said; it's outrageous, it's racist. But it's also because it has the he's dating this younger woman, he's married. It's like a soap opera, so people like to follow this. They're more worried about that than about you know the kidnapped girls. You know this 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 is it. You know so yeah, it helps. But I think even so, even if it, there would be no social media, it would be there because you know it's what people like to follow. Can I play devil's advocate? I mean, I generally agree with Fabio's, but just thinking about. 
This is part of being 52, <laughs> being old. Part of me says that no, actually I would disagree. I'd say that social media played a significant role because it sped up the cycle of here's the issue, yeah, right. how do you respond? Where growing up in the 70s or 80s, if this happened, there was no social media, it would have to be in print, it would take days to verify, someone would have to go to Sterling and get a comment. By that time, he'd have a PR team that was already on it that would say, oh yeah, you know, she's a prostitute from you know, some foreign country, look at her mugshot. They would have, they, I, I think maybe the speed of it really did help, where but traditionally they would. Have, they, they would. No, people would still cover it, yeah. Because yeah, people, people, right, uh, we had the Anita Hill and, and Monica, you know, Monica, but the, those were very high profile cases that got out. Oh, that's a great, them. but that, so, that speaks you know. to my point, because what, what, what the um, Bush administration and the, the people in the CIA who, you know, had interviewed Anita Hill 10 years before Clarence right. Thomas ever came up, they were very, very careful to find John Doggett right. to testify. And so because these things took time, there's no time to respond, and everybody's just flipping a hashtag, yeah, yeah, there's no time yeah, to respond. Right. I, think what, I think what she, um, she no, no. Think is that it would have been popular. Oh, yeah, no, it definitely would have been, 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 been popular, but right. tremendously popular. But it wouldn't have been a non-story, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, but, but I think the quality of the story got affected. Yeah. yeah. I just want to clarify Please. something really quickly. Mm -hmm. How, you talk about the League of Owners. Do they all know each other and have coffee and tea? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. It's a club. And they, they're so, actually an organization, and right. they vote okay. uh, on policy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Now, it, what's interesting is that they aren't, this is not a legal case. You know, this is, he's not being charged criminal. No, you know, so, but the, all, the league actually has rules that are enforceable that, and, and the owners are no, the no, 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 I, no, 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 that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying is, do we all know that they talk and share their personal stories? Right. The, reason right. why yeah, I, great the reason why I ask is because, <coughs> again, don't throw a chair. The chair coming out now. But the bottom line is that you all were quick to defend the players. That they knew nothing about his character. But when you spoke about the owners, everybody said, oh, well, they had to know. So we don't know what anybody really knows. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we can't really make those assumptions until we really know. We, that man might be ostracized by the owner from day one, much less that he has the reputation as he, uh, as you all have pointed out with the, with the, what was the apartment situation or whatever. So we don't really know that. So we can't really jump to that conclusion at, at this time. I just wanted to make that distinction. Maybe you all knew something I didn't know, so that's why I asked. But that was the interesting, interesting uh, uh, response that we that we got. My only comment to that that would basically be saying that. Um, white supremacy doesn't exist. So when most of the owners are white, because you're saying that, that comp they're not knowing his behavior, um, of course they know his behavior. They may not talk about it publicly, but right. I'm sure they say the same, feel the same views because the majority of the owners are white. Okay, so that's basically saying that they don't they 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 say that they do not live their lives within that existence is false. Well, why don't we so about the concept of hegemony then with the, with the uh, hegemonic masculinity with, with, with the African American players in this team? Do they not want to lose that hegemony as well then? That's a different issue. That's a different. That's a different issue of identity. And but when you're talking, we're talking about the owners because that's what you brought up. No, I brought up the concept of the response from the owners to the players, so we have to right. bring them up too. Well, we have. That was my point, okay? Mm -hmm. I didn't just bring up the owners. My, mm -hmm. my question was, why was there such a difference between how the owners responded and you all some way excusing the players not knowing? We weren't really excusing. Yeah, I mean, we okay, so that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so we, we weren't all excusing. We weren't all excusing. All of us were not ex no, 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 excusing I, the I players. I don't so. know. I know tennis. Yeah. I don't know basketball. Okay, I don't know. They might have to meet once a week. Right. They might, I don't know. That's why I'm asking you. But, but I mean, a number of us were critical about the players as well. But but I mean, just something that, in your name, I'm sorry. Pablo. Pablo, that you said that really transcends, I mean, it ties into the discussion too about owners, is you're right about the issue of Native American mascots. And, um, and you think, it, I've always, because when we had the um, last year, part of the presentation that I gave was on, talked about Native American mascots. And I don't know how many of you, some of you baseball fans, have you ever Indians. seen the Atlantic Braves, that mascot? <laughs> and it's just they hard not to become not the sick. They, 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 I think they got rid of the TPA. Did they find <laughs> <laughs> but, but the But the huge face of the Native American 
um, you know, yeah. look, looking very much buffoonish. Mm -hmm. and, and what has happened is that there have been people, and might, you might see this more of this with young folks on social media, they're saying, what if we took, say, a black person and, and showed him or her pick and cotton as your oh, mascot? How would you like that if we took a Jewish person, okay, and all the stereotypes to Jews, they went after every single ethnic group, and they said, and in fact, in a class I teach, we, my students read an article on playing mascot, and I said, let me throw it out there to all of you who are not Native American. You'd be, you'd be crying for somebody to lose his or her job if you saw an image of yourself like that mm -hmm. at an athletic game. And yet, we, whether we agree with it or not, it happens every season with Native Americans. Mm -hmm. But I am starting to see, certainly I know the New York Times is starting to run articles that people are questioning. Why do we have? Because we wouldn't allow it from any other ethnic group. And we wouldn't. But this one group reigns supreme. And as you pointed out, the term, of course, redskin, well, it goes a bit deeper than that. And that is that the redskin was after the settlers had, had, t had actually scalped them. That was what they meant by a red skin. And so we have teams that even if, again, it's not in your face, OK? But by merely having that image. And of course, you can't deny the fact that of the one group in this country, Native Americans in many ways the most disenfranchised people. They are the poorest people in this country. And you cannot disconnect what happened to them in their history from the reality that they live now. But of course, it's writ large in sports teams. And so your, your, your point, your question, there's no question about it, that that is crucial. That, that is in many ways the definitive <laughs> comment. And just one quick comment I have just for George. Did you folks hear that um, Donald Sterling, that his, the ownership is tied up in a trust fund? Mm -hmm. oh, no, I, I, just, I just heard that blurb, and so that makes it, of course, very complicated. Because you can't no, get to it. it. Right. Right. Yeah. If it's irrevocable, then you yes. yeah. That's what I was going to mention. Yeah, because I was mentioning. That's what they said. Like, the wife would be the owner. So she. No, we ain't. She's co owned. We ain't. That's the thing. I, yeah, I wanted to ask you because yeah, you talked legally earlier. Is, is, is uh, she is co owned. Of the team? She's silent. Isn't she silent? Well, she, 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 she came out and she came out and she said, like, I do not support. Because the wife, because, you know, this is now coming in after the mistress. No, I think you mean a silent owner. Like, she's now. Doesn't have a role in the team. Right. But she's technically. Technically, she's co-owner. You're right. She is a silent owner in that yeah, sense. She's silent. And she's now she's known. coming out trying to keep the team. And regardless of how the situation looks, legally, it's interesting to me because if she has co-ownership rights, she was not banned from the NBA. And, you know, she came out and said the right things. And some people are saying, well, well she must have known. She must be racist, too. Fair accusations. Fair accusations, you know, and I, I, I definitely, I definitely want to say she wanted her husband on the NBA. Yeah, yeah, like I would, I'm not going to sit to, right, so, but she went out and said all the politically correct things that you would expect her to say, and now she's saying she'd like to keep the team. Legally, I'd want to ask you because I don't know how that would go down, because do she, we, do we get like Adam Silver to like restate? Oh yeah, everyone who's associated. <laughs> right, <Where's the laughs> because in terms of the official statement, only he is banned. Uh -huh. yeah. Only he is back. Listen, folks, we got a lot of people that want to keep talking, yeah, and I'm afraid uh, that we are about out of time. Uh, I repeat the uh, refrain from Public Enemy. It might feel good, might sound a little something, but damn the game if it ain't saying nothing. Thank you all very much. Thank you, man.